All right. So uh, I did give I did give you a scenario. Let's say let's say John is a business owner and Jane is a teacher. They both married in COP and they have kids aged eight to eleven. The couple purchased a home for two million six years ago. There's an outstanding amount on the bond. Both Josh and Jane are actively saving for retirement with work pension plans and personal retirement annuities. Josh and Jane have their children as beneficiaries of their life covers uh, as, as they want their children to be taken care of when they die. So a lot of the questions I've been in, uh, getting is, what happens when one spouse dies, leaving the uh, family behind? So if you could talk us through that process and, uh, and tell us what happens. Like what happens when one, one spouse dies in terms from a financial point of view, what happens? What's, what's the process that's triggered? So, I mean, um, just looking at that scenario, um, the first thing I would, I would do is um, obviously look at the at structuring behind the scenario. So for example, in this one, um, you've got two well-to-do uh, clients and then they've, Firstly, left their life covers to their children. Yes. Now, in that, um, you've got a bit of a, a wastage of tax benefit because because people are married. Sars actually is quite kind to um, to husbands and wives who leave things to each other, okay. um, because they don't want to disrupt the situation. So the the first advice, or um, actually just rather, the first thing I'd want to actually establish with the clients are they. Are they happy to give up that benefit um, that they would get through leaving the their life covers to each other? Okay. So, if you if you look at um, the Estate Duty Act, there's a twenty percent tax that a client would need to pay on their estate when they pass away. Okay. They're three point five million rand rebate, which is a section four A rebate, okay. and then they've got a section four Q deferral, and that deferral just says that anything you, you leave to your spouse tax liability is deferred to the second dying okay so in this situation they would almost immediately have to have to contribute towards a, a SARS payment um, so I would always advise them to either leave their or to leave their life covers to each other mm -hmm. uh, to take make the most of those benefits okay um, and then secondly it's almost a, a, a forbidden thing to leave a child as a beneficiary on a life cover. Tell, tell us why. The services, so the financial services industry, um, so just let me clarify that. So if they say they're happy to pay the tax, they actually want the children to benefit rather than each other. Okay. And they're accepting that they're not going to get that four Q benefit. And they still insist that they want their children to inherit. Then you need to look at the structure behind the beneficiary nomination because essentially the children you mentioned the children are uh, eight and eleven now i always say to clients so if you leave things to a child think about it logistically that involves an eft from a life cover company of a yeah. large sum of money to who exactly and you can say just to the child but that child probably doesn't even have a bank account yeah. Then you're also giving an 11 year old a vast sum of money. That money is not going to go where it's supposed to go. It's going to be open to abuse. Suddenly they're going to have a lot of friends. They're going to have a lot of very yeah, of caring uncles and aunties who are going to become very close with that child very yeah. suddenly. And effectively, you can actually break the family unit. So the right advice of that would be to leave the funds to the estate. Okay. And then by way of a will into a testamentary trust. Because that money needs to be safeguarded and looked after for, for the children, but it cannot go into their own hands. So what the law says, when you're leaving money to a minor child, one of two things happens. Either it pays into the control of its guardians. Okay. It's should have. And the control of the child's guardians, mm -hmm. or it pays into a thing called the guardian's fund. Okay. depending on what kind of assets it is. Now, the Guardians Fund is run by the government. I don't really need to get into too much detail there. <laughs> yeah. But I don't want my kids' money going in there. Of course. Um, so that's where you get um, a properly drafted will and the setup of a testamentary trust, which will effectively mean that that money is controlled 
for the benefit of the child. And there's no risk on that child from family. There's no risk from friends. There's no risk on that child. Let's say the child's 16 when the parents pass away. What does a 16 year old want? A GTR. That's all they want. Yeah. A motorbike, a dirt bike, technology. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. And um, that's the kind of stuff you want to avoid because people often forget that money has a, has a purpose. Money has a job to do when someone passes away. But if you, put, if you don't put that money into the right structure, it's not going to do its job. So, yeah, those are, those are my two points I picked up there. The first one is we're wasting tax benefits by going straight to children instead of going across to spouses. Okay. And secondly, um, the, the, um, the beneficiary nomination of a child should actually never be allowed um, on, a, on a life cover. Now, um, with what that, happens with... Are, uh, Retirement benefits, uh, properties, uh, unit trust, shares. Uh, can kids be beneficiaries of those? So, you, um, unit trust, yes. Retirement, yes. Because ret retirement is actually different from the rest of the list of uh, assets you've given there. Mm -hmm. So, let's deal with retirement first. So, okay. retirement funds actually sit in a trust already. Yeah. So, let's say you decide you're going to use Mentum. Um, for your, your retirement annuity. There's actually a, a trust for that retirement annuity that your funds sit in. And they've got their own board of trustees. So you can put a beneficiary nomination there, um, but it won't necessarily always pay according to your beneficiary nomination. Okay. And that is a very, very scary thing for a lot of, a lot of clients. So um, just to break it down, if you look at life cover versus retirement benefits, Life cover is governed by the Long-Term Insurance Act. Okay. Retirement benefits, retirement benefits are, are governed by the Pension Funds Act. Okay. Now, in the Pension Funds Act, there's a section 37C, which says that, I mean, colloquially, what it says is that even if you do put a beneficiary nomination, it's more of a suggestion than an instruction because the trustees have the responsibility to decide who your financial dependents are. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if I take my retirement annuity, I've put my spouse on. Okay. Um, I shouldn't have started this uh, scenario with myself, but I'm going to carry on. <laughs> Let's say, for example, yeah. um, I'm going to get into trouble for this. Let's say, for <laughs> example, I've put my wife on as yeah. the beneficiary. Okay. When I pass away, there's two ladies in black at my funeral. Okay. Okay. Oh, Let's okay. I've got a girlfriend on the side. Yeah. But I've been paying her a salary of 10 grand a month. Yeah. This creates an issue because she is effectively a financial dependent of mine. Your girlfriend. So she can, she, yeah, the okay. girlfriend yeah. that no one knows about. Yeah. But she can actually apply to the pension fund for a portion of my retirement benefits. Wow. Because she's entitled to it in terms of Section 37C. And that's where it often gets a little hairy um, when, when a client passes away because. The wording says financial dependents are allowed to make claim to this money. So, so that really would include kids as well. Exactly. Yeah. Because the, there's a few little children running around as well and this and that. And it yeah. creates a, 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 lot of, a lot of drama. And that's why when I chat to, to clients, sorry, I've got the holly dogs going here. No problem. Um, when, I, when I chat to clients, I, I always say that, I mean, retirement benefits are great. Um, group life cover is awesome, but a short term, I mean, sorry, not short term, a, um, a life cover pays who you tell it to pay. It, yeah. it's, a, it's a blind money cannon. And that, that's the beauty of a life cover where um, you can actually know exactly where that money is going to go. So you've got a lot more surety sitting with a life cover than you do with like a group life cover or a pension fund. Okay. All right, cool. We, we spoke about um, assets going into the testamentary trust for clients, but um, with a, a lot of clients that I speak to, as soon as I mention the word trust, uh, the sort of fear comes about because most people view trust as something for, for the rich. Is, is that the so, case? No, it's not at all. Um, the thing is that a trust is, is an estate planning asset. Um, the, the easiest way to think about a trust is adding a person to your family. It's adding a person that can do anything that you or I could do. Um, and with an extra, call it body, in your family 
to, to grow well. Um, you can actually main, or maintain or, or attain a lot of benefits um, from a from uh, estate structuring uh, perspective. From I mean, even even on a tax perspective, there's, there's still a few benefits on a trust. Um, they're taken away most of the good ones, but there's still tax benefits on a trust. And um, but most importantly, that new person that you've added to your family can never die. So it just will carry on and carry on looking after the rest of your family as the as the generation grows. And that's that's the beauty of a trust because when I pass away in call it fifty years time, okay. so I end up passing away, my estate is over. So I need to pay my taxes, I need to pay my capital gains, I need to I need to actually liquidate my estate. Whereas because a trust is carries on in perpetuity, there's none of that that happens. So for example, I believe in trusts. If um, I've, I've got a, a family trust myself, when I buy a property, I put it into my trust because I know that that property will never have to be transferred again. Okay. Just forever, that's going to be a benefit going on for my children um, until someone messes it up. But um, the the intention is for it, for it just to carry on for it to carry on going. Okay, and what about what about the costs involved to set up the trust? Because we know there's different types of trusts. Before we go to costs, let's talk about the different types of trusts that are available to us as South Africans. Okay, so you've got a the main trust that people know about. Yes. Um, and yeah, so from a perspective of people knowing about trust, you've got an inter vivos trust. Okay, so an inter vivos trust is your general family trust. Um, inter vivos means between lives. It's just the trust that carries on forever. Yolanda, can I just ask you to give me two seconds? Sure. I've got a little bit of noise going on outside. I'm just no, ask, problem, uh, no problem, no problem. Just... Okay. Sorry, there were fat no, chats going on outside. No um, all right, so um, you've got your main trust, which is an interview loss trust. That's the one that most people know about, most people have, but that is the one that, that actually ends up costing a little bit more money than, um, than, than most other trusts. The reason being that it actually needs to be set up generally by an accountant or an attorney or um, someone who provides that service and they'll charge an upfront fee. All right. Now, capital, leg capital legacy has come in and we've got a little bit of a different model on that. Okay. Um, so from the 1st of October, we're going to be able to do that at no cost to a customer. Um, so we can, we can set up and, and draft and sort everything out for a um, client um, without having to charge an upfront fee because we're using the same model as the walls. Okay, so you're doing um, free trust setups for, for clients now? Yes, Perfect. we'll be doing that going forward from the 1st of October. The caveat is that we need, sorry, I, I lost you there. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Go ahead. It's all clear. Oh, sorry, there we go. Okay. So um, we, we've looked at trusts in South Africa and we believe that many trusts, if not most trusts, are actually not in line with what the law is of a trust. And the reason being that one of the requirements of a trust is an, a fully independent trustee. And a fully independent trustee needs to actually be a professional who understands the nose trusts. Okay. And it, at this, in the same breath, is not linked to the client in any way or form. Yeah. So a lot of people want to make their accountant the independent trustee. But the problem is that accountant provides services to the client. Mm -hmm. And is paid for those services, so he's not actually independent. Independent, yes. Um, applies for the family lawyer. They go, I want to get my lawyer to be a trustee on the trust, which is all good and well, except you also do legal work with him, and um, you pay him for his services, and that breaks that independence level. So what's available in South Africa is you've got a lot of trust houses who are independent trustees, but they are prohibitively expensive, and I'm yeah. talking about probably a few thousand rand a month wow. um, to, to act as that independent trustee. And that, that almost makes it um, The reason being, um, there's a lot of responsibility on an independent trustee. Um, 
where, but a trustee has um, personal liability on all the assets in a trust. So if something is wrong, that trustee can actually be held liable for any losses incurred. Wow. And for that reason, people um, it did to, to be an independent trustee. So what Capital Legacy has done is we've actually said, we will manage the trust, we will draft the trust, we will set everything up, we will provide basic accounting services, we will do everything that we need to do. Hello? But she just makes it accessible, right? All right, now uh, the last minute or so got cut off. So in exchange for drafting the trust for, for the clients, uh, what's in it for Capital Legacy? Other than uh, being placed as an executor. So um, remember the executor is on the client, the trust is another person. Okay. So what we do there is we wanna be the, we wanna be the independent trustee yeah. because by law, you need to actually have an in, a fully independent trustee. And like I said, that 2,000, 3,000 Rand a month is just too much for, for most clients. So what we've yeah. done is we've actually dropped that all the way down to 850 Rand a month. Okay. So that a client who has a trust requirement can have a fully independent trustee. Mm -hmm. And we've included in that basic accounting. Um, we've included the management of the trust, the minutes of the trust, tax advice, um, if we need to set up um, PTY vehicles to, to carry as any of that, all of that is actually included in the monthly 850 rand. Wow. Okay. Um, and that makes it a lot more accessible to a client um, who has a business or who is busy growing a, an estate. Because the problem with trusts is getting money into trusts is very difficult. So it's, easy to, or it's easier to grow funds in a trust. Okay. But actually getting those funds from your name into a trust is very difficult. And so you often get clients who are, let's say, 45, they've had quite a successful life, and they'll come to us and say, we want to do a trust. Yeah. It's all good and well, except that money is already in their name. Okay. And in, this, in the same way that I, um, you, you can't give me 10 million rand, yeah. that client can't give 10 million rand to the, the, trust. To the trust because of the nation's tax. Yeah. Um, and, and that's, where, that's where it gets a little tricky. So we're trying to find a way to encourage clients that will need trusts to do it earlier. Um, so that when they are 28 years old and doing quite well, they will start saying, I want to actually start my trust now. So that by the time they turn 45, the funds are in the trust already. We don't need to uh, try and so, get so those funds. Across. When is the best time to, to start a trust? When, when you start working, when you acquire a house, when you start a family, what are those events that should trigger you to, okay, to alert you, say, you know what, I need a trust now? <laughs> That's a very, very difficult question. Um, the thing is, your financial advisor should actually um, be able to judge that. And, and have a look at, at, the, at the way that that, that estate is growing, have a, have a look at, at the client's needs and actually make a judgment on what those needs will be in the future. Like I said, it's a very difficult thing. Yeah. Um, but basically, it's for the clients that, that want to, to box smart one day. So it's for the clients that would like to grow a substantial estate, but okay. don't want to do it in their own hands. They want yeah. to do it in the hands of a trust so that they can use that to, to look after. But again, it's a, it, it, it's a difficult thing because when you're young, you don't think about that. Yeah. When you're old, it's too, it's it's too late. <laughs> so you, you yeah. kind of got to find the guys, you got to find the guys with, who, who have the dream. Yeah. Um, the, the guys who want to, want to actually get it all, all done properly. But that being said, you can always do something with the trust. So I don't want to, I don't want people who are um, in in the, or middle aged to turn around and say, well, no, now I can't do a trust. You can always do a trust. Remember, you can always grow and and, and benefit from that. Um, but the the biggest benefits are if you're a bit younger. Yeah. Um, but once you um, once you have an estate, then I'd say come speak to us because we can give the honest advice on that and say, well. We can do this, that, this, and um, the client can then make the call on what he wants to do. All right, perfect. 
Uh, let's talk about, I know we went straight into trust. Let's talk a bit about uh, what happens if there's no will in place when, when a spouse dies. In the case of Josh yeah. and Jane, what would happen if there wasn't a will in so, place if one so spouse had to die? That, that is a, it's a big problem. Yeah. And the passing away, there's two ways to die in South Africa. The first way is testate. Okay. Um, and that is when you've got a will in place. And the second way is intestate, when you don't actually have a will. And your will is an extremely important document because it's your rule book. It's the rule book of in what's your voice when you when you cannot speak anymore. Um, and I mean, just putting it that way um, actually gives it the gravity it needs to have. When you pass away, your estate needs to be wound up, whether you have a will or not. But the rule book makes it a lot easier. Um, I always joke around and I say, passing away without a will is kind of like playing rugby with no rules. <laughs> okay. um, yeah. If you want to play rugby with no rules, sounds a little bit fun, but it, someone's going to get hurt. Yeah. The, it's the same with the will. Making sure that you've got the black and white in place and a properly nominated executor means that things go a lot quicker, smoother, and effectively a lot cheaper because we can make sure that you've got things going in the right direction. So drafting a will is a big pro problem in South Africa. Currently, 20% of South Africans have their wills um, in place. And that means that 80% just don't. And the problem is that when those 80% pass away, it creates those problems, those nightmare stories that you hear about. Yeah. And it's actually such an easy thing to do. Um, I mean, you, you're aware that Capital Legacy drafts will at no cost. We yes. can send a consultant out and get the will put in place. It's quick, it's easy, and um, it, it should be done by every response possible person in this country yeah. um, so when you pass away you have to firstly nominate an executor an executor is the person who steps into your shoes and manages and closes down your affairs okay. um, and that is a very important job so the, the misconception in the um, out in, in the market is that anyone can be an executor but the, the rules are quite clear when it comes to that. If your estate is less than 250,000 rand, then anyone can do the work. Okay. But if your estate is worth more than 250,000 rand, then you need a legally appointed executor. And it's actually insisted upon by the master, okay. which creates a problem when you've nominated your uncle or your brother or your spouse because they will be met with resistance when they try and do the work. And they will actually be instructed to go and get a lawyer. Okay. And that creates a problem because those lawyers will then come in and that's charge right. maximum fees. Yeah. Um, so that's why we say rather choose a company that you have heard about, read up about, and trust that will do the work quickly and efficiently. Um, in my personal situation, I will refuse to make my spouse my executor because I can just imagine what's going to happen if I do pass away. The yeah. last thing she wants to do is deal with my estate yeah. um, and go through my ID document and try and close the bank accounts. She can't do that. And mm. it wouldn't be fair on me to expect that of her. So I've got a legally appointed executor that I know will step into my shoes. I trust them mm -hmm. and they will do all the work and sort everything out professionally and quickly. Um, speed is, is um, very underrated when it comes to an estate because um, people say oh, it doesn't really matter how long it takes it really does because you want that to be over so that people can carry on with their lives and yeah. um, the average in this country to wind up an estate is just over two years wow which is a long time yeah and nothing should take that long so um with the way we've structured it our average is between six and nine months um, so i'd probably say you could safely say about eight months on okay. an estate and that's then done. The client can then carry on, or the, um, the client's family can then carry on with their lives. Yeah. I mean, that's a very important thing. But just getting back to, or answering the question, but getting back to um, the trust side of it, that there's also a very big problem there. If you just pass away, um, I, I say to husbands and wives when I, when I sit with them to draft their walls, I say, if you pass away, um, so it's not the end of the world. There's some life cover, there's everything will be fine, everything will go across to your spouse, we're all good, she'll be fine. Okay. The same applies if she passes away. 
If she yeah. leaves everything to him, the life comes, everything's cool, it goes across. The problem comes in when both pass away because what happens to the money? And that's um, like I mentioned earlier, depending on the kind of asset, you're looking at dealing with guardians of the children, which could be previous partners. Okay. Um, or could just be family members that you thought you trusted, but money changes people. Yes, it does. Or the alter alternative being the government. And again, <laughs> I hope that one day we can say that with pride, but currently the yeah. government's not great at looking after money. Um, so we need to make sure that in your will there's a testamentary trust. Now that's the other type of trust. It's, it's not the same as the intervivos that we discussed earlier. Uh -huh. A testamentary trust is actually an awesome thing because it doesn't cost any money. Yeah. It doesn't actually exist until required. So for me, I've got a testamentary trust um, for my children if me and my spouse were to pass away. I don't pay anything for it. It just lies dormant in my world. If I were to pass away, that trust would create itself and catch the funds to look after the children. Yeah. Um, and then going forward, that can actually make sure that the kids are okay, but it will avoid the government getting involved and it will avoid guardians getting involved with that money. And so, it's a so, much safer way to do it. So I know with uh, Capital Legacy, you guys are executors in, in the independent executors in the testamentary trust. Um, what yeah. are the benefits for parents, like knowing that if something were to happen, uh, their kids will be taken care of? So how is that trust? the testamentary trust, how is that administered from, you, from your side? So that, it, it is what we do. Um, I mean, we, we are trustees on trusts. Um, we um, have many trusts that we are currently looking after. Um, we also want, have wound up over a thousand estates um, in the last few years. The, so we know what we're doing when it comes to that, but our model is different because we look to charge the least or no amount based on the planning. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm sure you, you're aware of how we work. Yes. Um, how it works is we actually do a calculation up front with the client. So the last thing you want is a bill for your family. So what we do is when we sit with the client, we actually calculate everything for them and show them in rands on their estate what the costs will be so that they can make a decision on how to deal with it. And then we've got ins optional insurance products which clients can take. And uh, I mean, our average premium is in the region of about 150 rand a month, yeah. where they can know that all their costs are covered so that when they do pass away, to, to wind up the estates, to transfer any properties if required, um, to set up trusts for the children and to administer those trusts going forward, all those costs can be covered so that we don't have to um, sit in a situation where an invoice is delivered effectively to a child. And that's something which um, blows my mind. I've got a four-year-old and a six-year-old, and I get very cross when I, when I think about what's going out in the market with yeah. the invoices that are going out because people do charge a lot of money to do this work. Okay. All right, cool. What, um, what is the process, the winding up process, and the taxes that are due when a person dies in South Africa? So when a client does pass away, like I said, you've got to take their book of life and close it. So you've got to tie up all the loose ends. And the first thing that one does is obviously one doesn't rush into it because the family needs a bit of time. Um, but as soon as they're ready, then you go out and sit with the family and actually go through the estate and see what needs to be done and take information in. We, we've also got computer systems where we can check if the client has any shares or properties or cars or and we can actually find out what exactly needs to be done. Okay. So we make a big list of that, and then we start the work. And now how that works is basically an estate late bank account, or actually, sorry, rather, we need to get a letter of executorship issued by the master of the high court. Okay. Now, with a properly drafted will, um, the clients generally will nominate us as the executors. We can then go to the master and get our letter of executorship. And that's the first step on an estate. After that, we need to open an estate late bank account. Now that bank account gets opened. It's a, it's a trust account. It's, it's properly audited and, and there's, um, everyone has sight of that, that account uh, to, to make sure that everything stays safe. But then we use that as the bank account to finalize everything. So any income 
that would come in from a rental property or anything like that goes into the bank account. Okay. Um, any expenses that need to be paid when they come out of the bank account, and we actually keep a nice account of that and um, disclose that to the family as we go. We then need to do all the nitty gritties, like, um, I mean, people don't think about TV licenses. You know how hard it is to get rid of a TV license. <laughs> so we would need to transfer the TV license. We would need to sort out the cell phone accounts, um, the medical aid. Generally, the medical aid, people always forget to uh, to stop the medical aid when uh, when a client passes away. So they'll generally charge an extra premium or two okay. um, on the medical aid after the client passed away. We will go get that money back. And okay. we will say, you actually insured a guy who wasn't around anymore. You need to pay us back. So we'll get that money back in again. Um, we need to pay the insurances on the property or on the car or any of the things that still need to actually carry on. Mm -hmm. um, the bank account needs to be closed and that money needs to go into the state aid bank account. Um, properties need to be transferred according to what the will says. Yeah. So um, again, this is, this is where it gets difficult. When you pass away without a will, there's the formula of how people inherit. And it's generally a split through everyone in different percentages. So um, in your example, the wife would get X amount, the kids would get X amount, but let's say for example, that property, how, how do you transfer percentages of a property? It gets property. very messy. Yeah. So, but in a properly drafted will, you can say, no, I want my property to go to my wife. Yeah. We can then transfer that whole property to the spouse. Okay. And we will have to do that through the deeds office, obviously. Mm -hmm. Um, transfer the card, um, get everything sorted out. And then what, what we do is we have to do what's called a liquidation and distribution account. Okay. Now, a liquidation and distribution account is a picture of your entire estate and basically life in rands and things. All right. So all money that's coming in, all money that's gone out, all assets, it's like a balance sheet. Yeah. Um, and that needs to be submitted to the master for approval. And we actually let it lie open. Um, there's, there's time periods where you actually need to let it lie open for a certain amount of days okay. um, for public inspection. Okay. Um, we need to advertise for creditors. So if the client owes anyone money, we actually need to advertise in the paper mm -hmm. to say, does our client owe anyone anything? And then again, we also need to advertise and say, does anyone owe our client anything? Obviously, for the, the creditors, they're a bit quicker than the debtors. Yeah. But... Um, after that's all approved and our liquidation and distribution account is approved, we can start with the distributions on the estate. And at that point, we will then pay out the money um, to the family or to the testamentary trust or however we would need to uh, need to do all of that. And then after that, we close the file. Okay. All right, cool. We're out of time for today. Nick, thank you so much. Any, any last words you have for our listeners out there? Um. Well, from my experience with, with uh, doing what I do, the, from someone who knows how, how it works, the, the first thing, especially as a parent, that you need to do is get a will drafted. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm horrified by the, by the time that I go to a, um, a braai or a social gathering and people ask what I do. And I say, well, and they say, oh, I've never done that. But I can see their children running around. Yeah. And you almost want to ask people, but don't you care about what's going to happen? And, and the defense is that I don't know, but I didn't know that it's actually so hectic if I pass away without a war. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why I just like to tell as many people as possible, the consequences are dire if, um, if we do pass away without a war. Um, so the first thing to do is just get the document in place. It doesn't cost a cent to do using the right service providers. Um, I mean, uh, heaven forbid I say this, Use any service provider. Just get the papers signed. But um, if you do do it with Capital Legacy, we don't charge for the drafting of the will. So get that done. That is the, the absolute most important thing I can tell anyone. All right. Thank you so much, Nick, for your time. Hopefully we can have you back on right. to answer a lot more questions we have for you. There we go. All right. Uh, then. You have a lovely day. Okay, you as well. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.